I'm John Davis. I'm uh, the Learning Futures Advisor for Dudley Grid for Learning. Um, my role involves uh, challenging schools to be innovative, uh, encourage them to look at delivering learning in a different way in the 21st century so our young people get an appropriate experience. We do lots of unusual things, uh, some things we get wrong. We're not frightened of failure. We think we learn most perhaps from failure, so we, we embrace it and learn from our mistakes. But we get some things right as well. So one of the things at the moment we're doing is uh, rolling out a scheme that will provide an affordable device for every learner across the authority so they have one-to-one -one access. We're looking at a personal customised device, uh, perhaps a hybrid netbook stroke uh, tablet. Uh, but the idea is that uh, every child has uh, entitlement to having access when they need access 100% of the time for 100% of pupils. So at the moment we have uh, 5,000 plus netbooks across the authority. Within three years we hope that uh, 40,000 plus young people will have a personal device. So we've come a long way in, in the first 10 years of Dudley Grid. Um, what we see is a, a journey in learning with technology going through three phases, really. Uh, phase one, we would see technology being used to support learning. Uh, typically, that would mean you're replicating things you could do just as well using traditional technologies, paper and pencil. It, it's actually a very important phase to go through. It's a phase where teachers and young people get comfortable, familiar, and confident with technology. But it's a phase that we need to move out from. Second phase we'd identify in terms of moving on as uh, enhancing learning with technology. And in the enhancing phase, we are typically doing unusual things, things you could not replicate using traditional technologies, uh, enthusing and engaging young people, but again, not meeting our ultimate aim, which is the highest phase of learning with technology, which is about accelerating learning. And that phase, I think, depends on, first of all, people. People are the key to accelerating learning, but on top of that, the young people need access. Unlimited access actually restricts the ability to accelerate learning, to raise standards significantly, rather than just dabbling with e-learning. We, we think that until young people have uh, access to a device when they need to, making autonomous decisions about making using technology, then we're still actually e-dabbling rather than immersing them in, in genuine e-learning experiences. So I, I suppose a, a good illustration of what I mean in terms of supporting learning is if you take something like a Microsoft Word. Now they all have access to Microsoft Word. Uh, they all use it, but if I illustrate what I mean by, by referring to, to words, um, as a tool to support learning and replicating what they could do with paper and pencil, they might go to Word and actually type up a piece of work they've already written in their exercise book. And that might mean for, be for display reasons. But actually in terms of moving their learning forward has done little or anything. They might have picked up some useful ICT keyboard skills, but other than that, in terms of their learning, it's, it's quite limited. But again, an important uh, phase to go through. Moving on with Word to uh, enhancing the experience, then obviously you start adding images. You may well be uh, highlighting and changing fonts and um, getting some keywords to stand out. Uh, the piece of work is now looking a lot better, a lot different. I might be using the spell checker uh, to correct errors. But still, in terms of their learning, very limited, other than uh, perhaps some basic ICT skills. On the other hand, if you take Word and use it in a way that I very rarely see. So first of all, you need to attach to the computer uh, a microphone. So again, I'm, I might go into lots of schools and see hundreds and thousands of uh, headsets, but actually, if I go into an ICT, first thing I'm looking for is, are there microphones around the room? Because microphones are about inputs. Uh, young people putting their creativity into a piece of work rather than outputs that come through a headset. So let's attach a microphone to a computer and using Microsoft Word, three click clicks, 
insert object wave sound and open up the recording facility that comes with the word package. Now this term, this time when a, when a child inputs text into Word, we expect them to read it, to record it, to listen to themselves reading it, and then to go back and edit it. So now, on the Word document, not only do you see the text the child has generated, you also see a, a WAV file attached. Click on the WAV file, you hear the child reading that piece of work. So first of all, the child has to read their own piece of work. Then they start editing. The teacher comes along and uses their expertise to explain to the child what they might do to improve that piece of text. And then the child takes ownership of the process. They start to look at the editing process. They start to draft it and they start to manipulate and change that piece of work. At each stage in its editing, they again record, click, insert object waves sound very, very easy. It takes 30 seconds for them to learn how to do it. They edit it, and each stage it, it adds a WAV file to the bottom of the document. So I've now got a completed document. I've got the final text in front of me. But what I've got at the bottom is an audio trail of that piece of work as it went through the editing process. Our idea is the child clicks on the original piece of work and listens to the first piece of text they generated, themselves reading it. Then they click on the final, final audio file and they listen to the final version so they can hear how it's changed. Now the impact is dramatic. The most reluctant writer is suddenly engaged in the process, is drawn into the process and is enthused and engaged and wanting to write. And the actual idea is, is very straightforward. That lots of people talk uh, that writers need an audience. But the key audience for any writer is not the class teacher, it's not the classroom, it's not the school, it's not the planet if you publish on the internet. The key audience for any writer is the writer themselves. Until they're aware of that and appreciate that, then you never actually generally develop young people as writers. So we want them to recognise that the piece of work they're creating has first of all got to give them pleasure. They've got to be proud of it. So in get them to record it and to listen to themselves reading, they get a sense of the quality, not just how they've read it, but the quality of the language they're using and its impact on a potential wider, secondary, less important audience. Uh, there is no way you could actually replicate that, that learning experience using paper and pencil. It's about access. So with, with something like a netbook, uh, with an appropriate publishing uh, resource, Office Word, um, OpenOffice, presentation resources, or J2E, um, we can uh, engage with a range of tools to deliver a very slick experience, um, something you, you, you cannot hope to achieve using a paper and pencil. So using technology very innovatively uh, with creative teachers who you know how to get the most out of the technology and do things differently. So I, I think uh, one of the issues in terms of developing young, young people's all-round literacy skills is, and again, talking to young people, which I do a lot of, and again, lots of what we do is actually based on what they tell us uh, in terms of how they learn and their experiences of learning. But lots of them will tell us they spend actually a significant amount of their time listening and writing. They actually don't spend that amount of time talking, talking for a purpose, disciplined speech, discussion, uh, and reading. They spend some time looking, but actually not a lot of time in class, in in-depth analysis, studying when they're reading. So again, going back to the process I've just described, what we're doing is actually not separating out the four key elements of literacy, but actually merging them and blending them. So within that experience, they are reading, writing, talking and listening. And the, the whole experience is rounder uh, and in, more engaging. And again, the process uh, they find fascinating. So in, in terms of long-term outcomes, um, we wouldn't like to say we've got any evidence at the moment, but in terms of short-term outcomes, we, we recognize within certainly half a term a significant improvement of the quality of the writing. Uh, we see a significant improvement 
in their understanding of the process and their enthusiasm in wanting to write. And again, we have examples of you know, some rich language that's been generated from often you know, you know, quite reluctant, disengaged learners. I think certainly uh, teacher modelling writing. Um, actually, young people uh, working collaboratively uh, to generate work together uh, and modelling to each other appropriate use of language in, in a range of scenarios and situations uh, is a way of getting them to understand um, the flexibility of language and the appropriateness of, pro appropriateness of language in, in different situations. Mm -hmm. The big advantage, the great advantage of tra traditional technologies is reliability and availability. So nobody has to take a turn in using an exercise book. Uh, people don't have to wait to Thursday morning when they can access their literacy book. Um, so access is key to it. But another issue is a teacher mindset. Because a piece of work generated paper and pencil, the physical piece of work at the end of a lesson in an exercise book, has high currency for a teacher. It is evidence the child has, has created something uh, at the end of a lesson. Now, with electronic work, that's more difficult. And again, part of it is because of limited access, whether it's a timetable slot, slot once or twice a week, or whether it's taking turns using technology. So one-to-one -one access is again important, but it helps to change the mindset of the teacher to actually look at a piece of electronically generated, generated work with the same currency as value as a piece of work generated using traditional resources. So mindset shift and access are very, very important. And part of that is then an appropriate e-portfolio, storage area that can be accessed from anywhere very quickly and slick marking tools to help a teacher assess and comment on a piece of work in as appropriate or perhaps easier and more powerful way than actually collecting all the exercise books at the end of the lesson, taking them home at night in the car uh, to mark, but actually having a slick set of tools that actually not only makes the process easier for the teacher, but actually makes the uh, end product, the outcome, far, far more powerful and meaningful to the student. A traditional piece of work is very much a two-dimensional piece of work. So we talk to the kids about uh, you know, creating three-dimensional work, so the ability to add uh, uh, images that appear on cue or sound effects to enhance a piece of work. Um, to publish the piece of work once it's reached a standard where peer groups think it deserves publishing. Uh, the ability to generate a URL and then publish it to a wider audience within and, and outside of school is again another powerful incentive. So we just at, at the moment uh, running an initiative uh, to encourage young people to invest time in developing their 3D work with text, sound, images, video, um, and then going through a, a review process involving their peer group and their teacher, and, and then generating a URL, forwarding to us, and we will publish it in ICE, which is our replacement, a more appropriate replacement uh, than Google and Firefox. Uh, Google and uh, Yahoo and other traditional search engines but uh, ICE will publish their work 24 hours later so they can see their work uh, appear in a, an appropriate search experience for themselves, their families, and other students, wherever, to actually uh, see their work. Yeah, so, so ICE, we, we've just tweaked it. Uh, so again, the, the kids can, you know, if they're using J2E, it's, it's, instead of uh, using the sort of paper mode that... Uh, they can select, which is useful if you want to print, but again, we discourage them from printing. Uh, but they can choose a, a web version where they generate the work and it generates the URL. They forward the URL to us um, and we'll input it into ICE and tag it um, and classify it so they can see uh, how it compares against other young people's work from other schools. You know, that's a powerful. Um, Function, function we've got, which we've only just started to exploit. The managed service provider for DJFL3 have been tasked with making sure that any child coming into school with a personal device, whether it's a, a customised device that 
uh, they've acquired through DGFL, or whether it's a device they're bringing in from home, uh, they will be allowed to con uh, connect it securely to the school network and access the resources they need to access in school. So that's part of the contract for DGFL3. So we would expect to see, again within the next three years, uh, every child uh, coming to school with a personal device. We think that, that a customised netbook uh, with added functionality and added value that, that we would uh, bring to the device it is the key tool. Uh, but we're also aware that lots of young people already have technologies at home that uh, are not part of school learning at the moment, but certainly we would want them to um, have ownership and use of those devices in school. Some of these technologies are aspirational, so if you're talking about Apple-type devices, yeah. um, I, I would um, you know, question the all-round value of the device with you know across the school curriculum in most situations so you know, obviously there's something like optimum screen size and battery life and the operating system that runs on it and the browser you're using but to get you know full benefit out of something that like the learning platform then you need an appropriate screen size so we go back to our netbook stroke tablet device and again i think it's important they have a, an appropriate keyboard because again, too many of the, of the young people we see have uh, limited keyboard skills. Lots of them have high level of keyboard skills, but too many of them have actually quite limited keyboard skills. So we would want to see that developed with uh, an appropriate keyboard rather than touch technologies.